I felt uh, like before I traveled like uh, the night before my 10th anniversary. So uh, it's very exciting to be here. So what I'm doing to today will do is talk about a few papers uh, with uh, a number of people together. Some of this is, is quite old work, uh, almost 10 years ago we looked at pre-processing with and last year we looked again with from the angle of kernelization and how these things fit together. Uh, we'll see in the talk. Uh, so, let's see whether I know how to go to the next slide. Oh, there's uh, this one? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'll first explain something about tree width for, although I would guess that many of you will all know this, but just in case. Uh, then talk about um, pre-processing with reduction rules, pre-processing with sur safe sonorization, uh, safe separators, then fernization, and then uh, the conclusions in the end. But first, tree width. Well, tree width is a parameter of graphs. Uh, it tells more or less how tree-like a graph is. The notion of tree width as we nowadays use it was introduced by Robertson and Seymour in her work on graph miners. But actually, if you look through the history, there are a number of equivalent notions which, which predate the, this, this notion. Uh, um, uh, the reason why tree width is interesting is because there are many applications, uh, not only in the graph minor theory, but also in many other fields. And the main point is that many problems which are hard and tractable for general graphs become easy, often linear time solvable, on graphs when the with a bound of the tree width. And famous is uh, important is Coursell theorem here that every problem which you can formulate in monadic second order logic, you can solve in linear time if your tree width is bounded. <coughs> in a um, practical setting and also how we, we came to work on, on pre-processing is, is a, a notion called probabilistic networks. Um, this, this is a field from uh, expert uh, systems or decision support systems. And they have some kind of network uh, telling uh, something about uh, application domain. And they want to solve a problem called inference here. And it happens to be that these graphs usually have boundary tree width. And then you can then you can solve it in linear time with exponential and tree width. So all of these applications have as main point that the first step of the algorithm is you have to find the tree decomposition of your graph. And then you work on this tree decomposition and do something. And the second step is exponential. The, the time is exponential or even worse in the tree width. So what you want is good algorithms which actually determine the tree width of graphs for these applications. So what is a tree decomposition? Well, if I have a graph, then a tree decomposition is a kind of structure. Uh, which mainly consists of a tree, and for every node of the tree, I have a set of vertices associated to that node. And then there are uh, three conditions. Every vertex should be belong to a bag. For every <coughs> edge, there must be a bag containing both endpoints, like the edge GF is here. And then for every vertex, all the bags that contain that vertex must be uh, consecutive, so must form a subtree of your tree. If you have these three conditions, then this is a tree decomposition. And the tree width of tree decomposition is the size of the largest bag minus one. So you always have a very trivial tree decomposition of just one bag with all vertices. That, of course, has a large tree width. And you prefer something where the tree width is small, because then your algorithm is faster. So. Two lemmas which I'll use, uh, which are well known. The first one is that if you have a clique in your graph, then there is always a bag containing all the vertices of that uh, click, of that clique. And this is actually, uh, if you really know, see what this is, is it's, it's an old follows from an old theorem called the Halley property for trees. Uh, so this is all one, and the other. The lemma I always use is that if I have a graph, I contract an edge, then the tree width cannot increase. You can actually easily modify the tree composition of the old graph and make one of the new graph whose width is not larger. <coughs> so these are important lemmas. Um, okay, so 
Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and send this one. So let's go to the next one. So tree width is empty complete. <coughs> Uh, and but if you look to the fixed parameter case, then there is a, a linear time algorithm. But for every fixed k, there is a linear time algorithm that tests if the tree width of the graph is just k, and if so, finds a corresponding tree decomposition. It's a constructive algorithm. You can also construct the algorithm itself. And actually, uh, there was a master student of. Uh, Torben Hagerup, Hein Röhrig, who did uh, 13 years ago implemented the algorithm. And then, the, if you see the, the running time, the linear time is actually, you can use this kind of symbol for it, because even for a tree with four, it is it's so slow that it's useless. And for tree with four, there is actually a practical algorithm. So, so you, this is just a nice theoretical result, but in practice, it's, it's, it's pointless. There are many more results on, on the complexity of tree width. So in a practical setting, you want to do something else, like heuristics or faster exact algorithms. But one of the things also people do is if you have a hard problem and you want to solve it in practice, the first thing you do is you tree process the problem. And this is what, what I did. So you take your input and you transform it to a smaller equivalent input of the problem. And that's what I'm talking about today. Now, um, for tree width, there are actually two types of preprocessing which I know of. The one is what I would call reduction rules, and the other is uh, using what we call safe separators. So reduction rules is a kind of simplification. What you do is you take the graph, you have some rule which changes the graph locally, and then it makes it a little bit smaller, and then you repeat this stuff until you can do it anymore. You will see many examples of that. It saves just the microphone. Good. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. So, uh, safe separators splits. It takes a separator in the graph and it splits on it. We'll see. I'll, I'll go in both of these types of preprocessing rules in the talk. So, first reduction rules. So, um, the idea of a reduction rule is the following. So, I have my input graph. <coughs> Uh, instead of directly computing the tree width of my graph uh, and, and making the tree decomposition, instead I first preprocess the graph to a reduced graph, then I compute the tree width of the reduced graph, get the tree decomposition of my small graph, and then I am undoing my preprocessing so to get the answer from our original problem. So this is what people do in practice for many problems, but for tree width you can also do that. Let's take a few uh, oh yeah, so um, many of these rules are actually, it's helpful to have some, to know some lower bound of your graph. Uh, for, and what we do is we have some extra variable which I call low, it's the lower bound for the tree width of the original graph. Now I say that a rule is safe if I modify my graph and my lower bound to a new graph and maybe a new lower bound if the maximum of the tree width and this lower bound is equal. Because in that case, if you have the tree width of your small graph, you can easily get the tree width of your original graph. And hopefully you also can construct the tree composition. And the algorithm is just the following, all these algorithms are of the following type. While I have C, some safe rule in my graph, I apply it. And I repeat this and so on. So what's it? Um, the number of reduction rules, well, I th the first rule, set of rules we just take from an old paper of uh, Ivor and Proskorovsky. Uh, rules that recognize <coughs> graphs of 3 with 1, 2, 3. Then we use this together with Ari Koster and Frank von der Eickhoff in 2005 or a little earlier. Uh, using preprocessing heuristics for tree width. So we, we use these rules and generalize them and saw that these are actually And with Frank, Frank uh, uh, generalized this even further and showed that you can do also weighted variance. In 1996, there is a paper by Sanders which shows that uh, tree width 4 can be uh, solved in linear time. And he does this by using and giving a set of reduction rules again. And just this year, a student of Ari Koster, uh, Hein is, called, is his back name, 
he showed he experimentally evaluated and showed that it's actually working in practice also. And now in in the, just this year uh, with Bart Janssen and Stefan Kratz, we um, we looked at this from the perspective of kernelization, and we got a number of new rules, but also showed that you can actually get some certain types of kernels for this. And just this this fall, a student, uh, a master student in Utrecht, Vincent Kreutzen, implemented the rules from that one, and, uh, show, and indeed in practice it also works. So this is actually a case where there is this, this, this interaction between practice and, and, uh, <coughs> and, and, and experiment. So some of these uh, experimental work was already heavily influenced by the theoretical results, and also some theoretical results were motivated by what we saw in the experiments. So the first example, uh, what I want to give is what I call the series rule. Uh, very simple rule, if I have a vertex of degree two, then what I can do is I, and my lower bound is at least two, then I can remove this vertex and make its neighbors adjacent. If they are already adjacent, I also remove it. So this is my, and you know that the graph, if the tree width is at most two, then this, the tree width doesn't change by this operation. So this is called the series rule from the, all this is, comes from the work of recognizing graphs of three with one, two, three. So you can apply this rule by say, I have this graph here, I apply the rule, I apply the rule again, I apply the rule again. Now, if I have a click, then it's very easy to compute the tree with here. So this is an optimal tree decomposition of that click. And then I undo the reductions by just adding these vertices back as and adding the back, back, see back, back, and now I have an optimal solution of my original graph. So this is how you can do this. So the, there are generalizations, and, and I think two important rules which we use in our work were the simplicial vertex rule. Now a vertex is simplicial if its neighbors form a clique. So this vertex V is simplicial because its three neighbors are, are a click. And then I also have the notion of almost simplicial. A vertex is almost simplicial if all its neighbors, except maybe one, form a click. So this vertex V is simplicial because its neighbors, except the blue neighbor, form a click. And we have nice preprocessing rules for that. The first is simplicial rule. If I have a vertex which is simplicial, I remove, can remove the vertex and update my lower bound to the maximum of the lower bound and the degree. It's very so easy to see that this is actually a safe rule. If you have a tree decomposition of this graph here, you know there is a back containing this click, and you can add a new back containing V and its neighbors adjacent to that click, and that gives you a tree decomposition. There are special cases, for instance, if you have a vertex so of degree zero or one, it's always simplicial, so you can remove all of these. The almost simplicial rule uh, in our old paper was version uh, is the following. If I have an almost simplicial vertex, then and my, the lower bound is at least degree of this vertex, then what I can do is I can remove this vertex and turn its neighbors into a click. Or another way is saying that I contract this vertex with <coughs> its special neighbor. Uh, and this is actually safe. This is, this is um, a rule which doesn't change your tree width while the lower bound is bigger or equal to the green. So we can show uh, this um, in, in, so one direction means that if you apply the operation, the tree width cannot increase because it's, you contract, basically, an edge. So, and the other direction is, suppose that we have a tree decomposition of a small graph. Now, well, you know that this neighborhood, this new, the new neighborhood of the vertex is a click. This, this set of neighbors forms a click after you remove the vertex. So I can actually add this vertex and its neighbors as a bag. And because the, the lower bound was uh, 
the degree is less or equal to the number of bounds, the size of this bag is less or equal plus one, the size of this bag is less or equal than the tree width plus one. So it's actually you cannot you don't get uh, you don't increase the true uh, Okay. Now in the old work of uh, uh, we of, of this, this recognizing tree with one, two, three, there are other rules. The one of them is the buddy rule. If I have two vertices of degree three, the three common neighbors, what you can do is you can always uh, remove these two vertices and make these three into a click. This is safe. And then there is a so called cube rule. If you have this pattern in the graph, then you can actually replace it by this pattern. So the red vertices are actually not adjacent to other vertices and then you can do this. So the nice thing is that with the, uh, this is by Einborg and Polskorowski, with these rules you um, are always sure that you reduce any graph of three with at most three to an empty graph with the set of this rule, these rules. So this is nice uh, uh, also for and this gives also a very practical algorithm for a tree with one, two, and three in this way. But then you can also use this as uh, pre-processing or in, in addition, you have some lower bound rules which just increase your lower bound. For instance, if no rule applies and your lower bound is three, you know that you can set your lower bound to four because all graphs of lower tree with most three are reduced by these rules. And you can also combine this with lower bound heuristics to get your low up, so I have to, to fire some uh, almost simplicial vertex rules. So we implemented this. Um, so here is just a lot of data, but there is more. But what what was nice to see is that for many graphs, actually, we had quite a dramatic. Uh, improvements to the preprocessing, and actually the, the the algorithm is quite fast. It runs all the graphs with a thousand vertices just in a few seconds, usually. Um, so, uh, but in many cases you have these 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 low these these sizes of these graphs are getting them dramatically back. So Pix is something from well, it's an application of, of some disease which Pix can get. You see, of course, here that. Uh, you go if you go from 400 to 48, and then any usually an exact algorithm. So, for instance, there has a dynamic programming algorithm which works quite well, and on graphs of this size, you can solve the problem exactly. Uh, and in some cases, actually, the red ones, you, we had uh, cases where the true width ones, the, the reduced graph was empty, so we already already preprocessed and solved it exactly. So this was um, our first uh, approach. Excuse uh, me. The second. Excuse me. This yeah. if you can go back. Yeah. You said if if you reduce the empty graph, then the preprocessing is exact. But if we have this low constraint, whatever. Yeah. If you have a graph which has a lower tree, then then uh, if you are preprocessing with respect to um, low four, and you get a graph of three with three, for instance. You, yeah, you should of course work with the correct. Uh, you should start with a value low, which is a lower bound for your tree width. So if you don't know anything, you, don't know you start with low zero. But if you don't know it, oh, you can always start with low okay. zero. Okay. okay. Yeah. Or if the graph has an edge, you start with low one. <laughs> so yeah, and, but you can also run a lower bound heuristic and then use that as your first initial value, which is a good thing to do. Hmm? You can compute the maximal click also, which is of course an empty hard problem, but on the graphs of this size is faster. No, maximal, maximal. maximal click is possible. Yeah, so there are several, but there are better things actually than maximal click. I could have given a talk on the Orban for Cree also, but maybe another time. So so let's let's go quickly through safe separators because I need to have some, want to spend some time on the kernelization also. So if you have a, uh, a separator is basically, well, you know what the separator is, right? But I call the separator safe if I can do, if I have the following, I have the separator. Now I split my graph in components and every part 
contains the separator, but also I turn the separator into a clip. <coughs> so if I have, if, if this red vertice is our a safe separator, then I would get these graphs. And now what I want is that the tree width of my graph is actually the maximum of the tree width of these graphs. Then I call a, a separator safe. So there is a, so well, how do you use this? You split your graph with your safe separators, you get smaller graphs, you solve, maybe you repeat them. You can actually use preprocessing rules or reduction rules also there and solve them each component separately. And then you know the tree width is the maximum of the tree width of these graphs. Now, we saw that actually a number of separators are safe. For instance, uh, it was well known that click separators were safe, uh, are safe. But, and with Ari, we had a few others. Uh, now, actually, minimal, almost click separators are safe. So a separator is minimal if it does not contain a smaller separator, as a, another separator as a proper subset. And it's almost a click if, all it's, if it's a click except that one vertex does not belong to the click. And we all, all of these are actually safe. You can show that. And as a corollary of that, all minimal separators of size 1 and 2 are safe. And also all minimal separators of size 3 that split off more than one vertex are all safe. So only, the only separators of size 3, which are just the neighbors of one vertex, that's the only case which does not apply, but all others of size 3 are also safe. So, um, well, so the idea is, so this basically, if you have these, these uh, you split this graph, and here, what you can do, you know because this is a click, you can actually, oh, this should be, yeah, you can, if, if it's a click, then actually you have these, these 3D compositions and then you can glue them together to a 3D composition of your original graph. And because the separator is a click, you know that there is a bag involved which contains the separator, so if you glue it like, like this, then you ha can have a 3D composition. So we applied this also, and it actually works. Uh, there's a lot of data here. I think I should not explain this in detail. But it worked quite well, actually. And then in many cases, we, we, we were able to split the graphs in really small parts. <coughs> so this was basically all what we did, say, 10 years ago. And now we were looking back to it again uh, last, um, last year, and, and now from the perspective of organization. So, um, Kernelization is basically what you have is if you do pre-processing, you want to prove a bound on, the tree, on, on what you actually can get on, on the quality of your pre-processing. So you cannot have pre-processing where you know for sure that you always reduce the input size of the graph. Because if I would have an algorithm which always takes an input and turns it into a smaller input in polynomial time, I could just repeat this until I have nothing left. And then if my problem would be NP complete, then I would have a proof of P equals NP. So I cannot do that. But what we do instead of kernelization is we prove a bound on uh, the size of reduced instance as a function of some parameter of your input. So parameterized problem, so what is a problem where you have basically two parts of your input. One part is the normal input and the other is a part which I call the parameter. And in many cases, uh, in like, is the parameter is just a number you ask for, like vertex cover. Is there a graph of vertex cover in most k? Then often I say k is my parameter. But you could also use other things, like the tree width of your input or something else. Now, I say that the parameterized problem is said to have a kernel of some size fk if I have an algorithm which maps an input uh, of the problem to, an, to another input of the problem with the following properties. The algorithm should use polynomial time in both polynomial in the size of my input plus my parameter. And then for every input, I should the algorithm should map the algorithm to an equivalent instance, so the answer should not change, so yes instance should be mapped to a yes instance and no instance to a no instance. And then 
So this is just preprocessing actually, but no, not that preprocessing. But now I want also a, a bound. And I said, say that if an input is mapped to another input, then my uh, the size of my input should be bounded by the function f of the parameter and also my new parameter should be bounded there. So if I have this, this bound on, on my size, then I say I have a kernel. And this is a notion which comes from the fixed parameter tractability. It usually is used in the field for showing that problems are fixed parameter tractable, but it's also, you can also view it from the point, viewpoint that you say, okay, I have a pre-processing algorithm and I have a provable bound how good this pre-processing is. Um, so what can we say about tree width? Can we actually have a kernel for tree width? Well, you, um, there is actually a negative result uh, by uh, Rodani uh, fellows and Danny Hermelin and me, which tells that we actually cannot expect that tree width has a, a kernel which is polynomial in the normal parameter, the tree width. If you ask, is this graph has this uh, tree width must k, there is not a polynomial kernel of whose size is polynomial k. So that's bad. Unless, and that depends on some strange uh, complexity theoretic assumption, what we call the Ant distillation conjecture. But instead of looking at the parameter tree width itself, you can also look at other parameters of your input. And the first one I want to talk about is tree width with a given vertex cover. So what I have, I have my input is a graph, an integer k. The question is, is the tree width must k? But I also have a vertex, co a vertex cover of my graph. And the parameter is actually the size of the given vertex cover. Now, if you don't have a vertex cover, you could also first run a two approximation algorithm for vertex cover, and that would blow up everything by a constant factor. So that doesn't really make, make a big difference. So with Bart and uh, Stefan, we showed that there is a kernel with a cubic number of vertices. <coughs> the size, uh, or it should be L to the third, actually. So the size of your vertex cover to the third number of vertices. Um, so this is a polynomial kernel. And I'll explain the thing here to prove here also now. So actually, we basically use three rules. The first rule is more or less the simplicial vertex rule, uh, but now used in the setting of a decision algorithm because we're looking at, at the decision problem, is the tree with most k or not. Uh, now if you have a simplicial vertex of degree at most k, then we just remove it. Uh, and if you have a simplicial vertex of degree more than k, then I say no, because I have this vertex with its neighbors from a clique of size k plus uh, 2, and then the tree width is at most k, at least k plus 1. Um, there's also another simple rule. If my uh, size of my vertex cover is less or equal than the tree width bound, then I just say yes, because I have a very simple construction that shows that the tree width is uh, at most uh, the size of the vertex cover. Because if you remove the vertex cover, you have just uh, isolated vertices, you make a trivial tree composition of width zero, and then add everywhere all the vertices in the vertex cover there. Now, in my or the definition of kernelization, I will not allow to say yes or no, but you can actually, so you want to, to reduce it to a, an equivalent instance. So instead, actually, <coughs> instead of saying yes or no, formally you should transform it to a very tiny graph, which is a yes or a no instance. But that's a technicality. In practice, of course, you would just do this. Then we need one more rule for, for this result, which is, comes from my linear time algorithm from 1997. And this is what I call common, uh, used more often in, in other settings for tree width, which I call the common neighbors rule. Now, if I have two vertices in my uh, vertex cover, and they have at least k plus one common neighbors, then I can add this edge. 
and I don't change the tree, my answer to the problem. Uh, because actually this is a complete bipartite subgraph <coughs> and then there is a theorem that tells if you make a triangulation then you should either add uh, of the graph either this is an edge or this should be a click. But if this is a click then you have a click of size k plus two. So that's why it's safe to add this edge. So this is my, so that's actually a strange rule because it actually makes your input larger. But in, uh, it, I don't add edges, I only add, uh, I don't add vertices, I only add edges, and this is helpful because it actually gives you additional constraints on what you can do with making 3D compositions. And this is also sufficient to get our kernel, which is polynomial in the size of a vertex over this row. But now the last thing is I have, so the algorithm is just, while I can apply one of these rules, I just do this. This is my whole kernelization of it. And now, once I have done this, my reduced graph has at most uh, the size of my vertex cover squared times k, or k to the third, or l to the third vertices. Um, so, and the idea is the following. So every vertex I have, uh, which is not in my um, every vertex which is not in, not in the vertex cover is not simplicial because if it would be simplicial it would have been removed so for every vertex I have two neighbors which are not adjacent so what I do is for every vertex not in the vertex cover I assign this vertex to a pair of non-adjacent vertices in the vertex cover now, if a pair of vertices in the vertex cover has at least k plus one pairs assigned to it, then my uh, common neighbors rule would fire, and I would add the edge. So I cannot assign more than k vertices to a pair. I have k square pairs, so I have k to the third vertices. So this gives me my bond on this algorithm. So, yeah. Now, the next result we wanted to get is the looking at feedback vertex set. Um, so we had this result for, for, for vertex cover, and then the next question is can we also do with feedback vertex set? So the feedback vertex set in the graph is a set of vertices. If you remove the vertices from the graph, the rest of the graph is a forest. So it doesn't have, so another way of saying is that every cycle, it contains a vertex for every cycle on the graph. And so here, that's a way. Um, so, and what we have in our paper was a, a kernel which has basically a, a k to the fourth, the size of the feedback vertex set to the fourth number of vertices. So still a polynomial kernel. This, this is really quite, quite hard and I cannot explain all of that to you. But the first step what you want to do is, is I can show you how we actually bound the number of leaves in the forest. And then the other thing you have to do is to have some kind of bound on long paths in the forest and that really is a lot of technicality. But bounding leaves is actually nice because it uses the almost simplicial vertex rule but it really has to lift it up a little bit. So if you take a leaf in the forest, and if it's not almost simplicial, then I know that uh, there should be two non-adjacent neighbors. So let's look at this red vertex. So every leaf in the forest has at most one neighbor inside the forest. So all its neighbors except one are, uh, it has, all its neighbors except one are in this feedback vertex set. So if it's not almost simplicial, then it has two non-adjacent neighbors in the feedback vertex set. And I can use the then the same. So if I can bound the number, if I have a rule which removes almost simplicial vertices, I can bound the number of leaves in the forest by a similar counting argument as before. Because if I have, um, 
do I have a sheet for that? Yeah, um, if I have, <coughs> for every, every leaf in the forest which is not almost simplicial, I have two non-adjacent neighbors. And if I, for every pair here, I can have only uh, k non-adjacent neighbors because otherwise the common neighbors will would fire and I would add the edge. So what I really need to do is I need to have a rule which removes all, uh, almost simplicial vertices. Well, I had one, right? But it was not entirely complete because it has this, 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 this nasty thing with the low inside. They're actually, um, so we have to, we have to modify it. And we got now what we call the new almost simplicial vertex rule. So if I have a vertex which is almost simplicial, then, well, the first case is like in like the old rule. If my degree of my vertex is at most uh, k, then I make the neighbors of the vertex into a click, and I remove the vertex. And the safeness follows just from the safeness of the old, almost simplicial vertex rule. Now, if the degree of the vertex is at least k plus 2, I can say no, because I have a click of size k plus 2, so the tree is larger than 1. So the, the only remaining case is that if the tree width of my vertex is exactly k plus 1. And then, um, then there is a, a nice uh, test which you can carry out. And either I say no or I make the neighbors into a click. And the test is the following. I look for every pair of neighbors of this vertex and uh, this almost uh, simplicial vertex. And uh, if I have that for each pair, either the edge exists or there is a path from the one neighbor to the other neighbor that avoids entirely the neighborhood of V, except of course for the endpoints, then I just say no. And otherwise, I make the neighbors of V into a click. So, no, I don't have a picture. So that's point. So I have my almost simplicial vertex. I have my special neighbor. Here is my, here is the click. <coughs> so what I want is that for every vertex, so basically I should just have for, there should be some path. Either there should be an edge, or there should be a path on side V, which goes here. And the idea is that if you if you have this path, then you can actually do contractions and you can show that you have the proper minor and you have this, this, then that is, uh, that you have actually a click minor. Because if you have these paths, you can do some contractions such that this entire set becomes a click and then you have a subgraph, a minor, which is a k plus 2 click. So, and then you can say no. And also, you have the other direction, you have a construction that if this test does not hold, so there is one pair here where you actually <coughs> don't have this edge, then actually you can uh, remove V and make these neighbors into it. So there is a proof which would take a little bit too much time to explain here, which shows that this is actually safe. So what is nice is actually that this, um, this rule removes all sim almost simplicial vertices, not depending on the degree. In the old case, we have that that depends on the degree, but now we can actually remove them all. And so this rule shows that you can remove all almost simplicial vertices, and then uh, with the counting argument, you have a bound of the number of leaves in your forest. And then there is a, a, an eight-page proof which gives you more rules for actually getting this, this cubic kernel, this k to the fourth kernel also. Because but that really needs uh, some kind of complicated rules for long paths in the forest. Uh, so this is, so this is, what we then did was actually look at how it, uh, so, uh, do it worked in practice also, so we, uh, my, my student implemented this, uh, just this fall, 
And you, as a, as a pre instead of using a preprocessing, uh, you don't do a decision problem. So instead of saying no, <coughs> you just increase the, the lower bound by one. You have a lower bound. Instead of saying no, you can increase the lower bound by one, which is nice because after that the degree is the low is larger. So in the end, you either increase the lower bound by one, but the vertex still is almost simplicial. So at some point, you will remove it. So you remove actually all almost simplicial vertices in this preprocessing step. We also implemented the common neighbors rule and generalizations of it. So if you have two vertices which don't have k vertex disjoints <coughs> between them, then also you can add the edge. It's a similar type of proof works. And to test whether there are disjoint parts, you can do this with flow with using Fort Fulkerson. Uh, and we implemented this also. So we had actually two experiments. One, we used the new almost simplicial vertex roll on uh, 570 graphs. So we have a large test set of graphs where we tried all these, these algorithms all the time. We tried them all, all, all of them. And we noted that on 160 of the 570 instances, there was some additional reduction. Often it was small, just one, two vertices, but in several, several cases also there was quite a dramatic uh, additional indu uh, reduction. There were a few cases where the new rule actually helped to preprocess the entire graph. Um, the running time was a lot larger, so we had 1.7 seconds for a 600 vertex graph, for instance, but it was still good. It's still a matter of seconds. Uh, the, um, the second rule is using this and then using the common neighbors and common this joint path rule. This was released sometimes very slow, so on a, because it's actually you have on it, it's it's something like n to the sixth actually if you already look to the type of worst case running time. Uh, so that that even on thousand vertices uh, is kind of nasty. Oh, and to the seventh. But still, in, in many cases, it's practical. So for 100 vertices, it works uh, quite well. And and you get further reduction. So actually, you add edges, but because you add edges, then the old rules fire again. Because adding edges is nice because you have more quickly simplicial or almost simplicial vertices. So we add, here are a few test data. Yeah, I just this is just being written up, so I just have four graphs here which are more or less showing what happened. Uh, so uh, this was uh, with, the, with the old almost simplicial vertical rule. This was, so you see with the new one. So small improvements, although for instance with this graph here, that was quite dramatic improvement. So, and the lower bounds often went up quite a lot also. So it worked quite well in, in practice also. So we're still working on this, so we're implementing uh, the second experiment, trying to speed it up to see what happens on random graphs. But the general conclusion is that the new rules also work. And I think it was a nice example how, how the, the, of the interaction between theory and practice. So the first question was actually theoretical motivated because we just one wondered to find a kernel for tree with, with these parameters. And then after we had this, the question was how does it work in practice? And indeed, it also works in practice and helps actually to get further reductions and get smaller equivalent inputs. Um, so I come to the conclusions. So I, I showed you a few, few uh, preprocessing heuristics for tree width reductions and separators, uh, and also showed you kernels. So nice of about the vertex cover result. Actually, the only thing we needed were things we already knew. Uh, the only, and then there is a counting argument which is similar to counting arguments, which are quite often used, uh, like the pigeonhole principle. So. It, it was almost an exercise if you just plug in known things together. The feedback vertex set rule uh, was quite 
much more work. But what really I liked here was this generalization of the almost simplicial vertex rule, which you use to bind the number of leaves in the forest, and then you'll have some more rules. And again, the same type of counting argument. Um, and it was what I think also this work shows is that there is this important and nice interaction between algorithmic graph theory at one side and experimental work at the other side. And it, it influenced each other uh, in, in both directions. Um, at this moment, together with, with Bart Jones and Stefan Kratsch, we are looking at kernels for path width. There are quite surprising rules which are surprisingly correct. So maybe uh, in two years' time I'll get, tell, tell you about that in a half an hour time, um, what, what, how these things are going. Uh, but uh, that's still still being tested whether our proofs are correct. So, so. Okay, that was what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.